Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Dine Around Downtown Cooking at Home edition. If you are new to the program and have not seen any of our previous episodes, please be sure to check out our website. They're all on there at downtownny.com slash dine around. Uh, okay, so I am Rondi Jean. I am the event manager for the Downtown Alliance. And the Downtown Alliance is the business improvement district for Lower Manhattan. And what we do is we make Lower Manhattan a better, safer, cleaner, more vibrant place to live, work, and visit. And one of the ways we do that is by providing support to local businesses. Uh, Dine Around Downtown Cooking Home Edition began in June of 2020 during the height of the pandemic and has been part of our continuing efforts to provide such support to local restaurants and food security charities that have been impacted by COVID-19. Uh, today, our restaurant has chosen World Central Kitchen as their food security charity. Um, and they are, I'm gonna share that with you in the chat. Uh, and uh, anything you can donate um, to help support this charity, uh, you can learn more about them uh, on their website, which is wck.org. Uh, and again, for your convenience, I put it in the chat box. Uh, and speaking of the chat box, I'm gonna go over a couple of housekeeping things. Um, one of them is uh, the Q&A. Uh, well, first of all, we're recording this uh, webinar. So if you're watching at home and you wanna cook along, we will share the link tomorrow uh, via email to all of you, everyone who signed up for the event. And uh, you can follow along and cook at home uh, during the weekend if you can't at this moment. You can just enjoy watching the program. Uh, <laughs> during the demo, if you have any questions, we have a Q&A feature, which is located at the bottom of the screen, or if you're using a phone or iPad or tablet, you can tap the screen once and uh, depending on the device, it will be either at the bottom of the screen or on the top right. And this is where you can share any comments or uh, questions that you might have for the chef, the guest chef and for our host. And we will answer them as uh, best we can throughout the program. And if we don't get it to any of the questions, we'll try and answer them and send them to you in the email tomorrow as well. Uh, and then, so that means the chat box is reserved for me to share things with you guys um, while the program is going on. And uh, one of them is our Post Your Plate contest. And that is a contest that we have where you can enter to win a 30 minute private virtual cooking class with tonight's guest chef by simply posting your plate on Instagram and using the hashtag Dine around at home and tagging at downtown NYC. Uh, check out the link in the chat box for more details and don't forget to tag the restaurant and Rocco as well, our host. Uh, and I think that's it. And speaking of Rocco, <laughs> uh, please welcome your host uh, this evening and every cooking demo that we do. Uh, uh, he is the James Beard award winning chef and New York Times bestselling author, Rocco Despierdo. Hi, Rocco. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Ron. It's great to be here again. Thanks for joining us for Dine Around Downtown, Cooking at Home. Uh, I believe this is the 12th or 14th episode, uh, and we're thrilled to have you back. Uh, today, we have a very, very special chef. Uh, her name is Amy Sur Trevino, or Trevino, the way the, uh, the way the Italian in me wants to pronounce it. She is the chef of Malibu Farm down on South Street Seaport. It is a wonderful ocean-to-table, farm-to-table restaurant that uh, she it works at every day, personally curates the menu, and has worked with some of my favorite chefs in the industry. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Chef Amy Sur Trevino. How are you, Amy? Good, how are you, Rocco? What's going on, Chef? How's things? Oh, things are beautiful. It's a nice day out here. Uh, I got is a beautiful South view Padre of the Island Brooklyn Bridge. Is, fun? is South Padre Island as fun as I remember it in college? Oh yeah, no, it only gets better. <laughs> That's where you're from, right? That's exactly where I'm from, yes. Uh, grew up on the beach, really amazing. Got to jet ski, um, eat, a, eat a lot of beautiful seafood. Uh, my great-grandfather -grand started feeding it to me when I was about three years old and, you know, just fell in love with everything about seafood and, and the islands. I'm and a you never have kid. to worry about winter. No, you don't have to worry about winter. Not, not and what are those spring breaks really like? Tell me everything. 
Oh, my mom might be watching this, so we can't really. <laughs> I didn't mean this. for you personally. <laughs> I just meant what have you observed on spring break? <laughs> no confessions needed here. <laughs> and um, hopefully, no, your mom break. is watching. I know she. Yeah, hopefully, she is. Um, hi, on chef, spring mom. break, you know. <laughs> hi, mom. On spring break, you know, it's a uh, it's a lot lots of families, lots of crowds. We have international people coming uh, from all over the world. And it gets it gets quite packed, um, but as a local, you learn to appreciate everyone coming down. And you know, it's it's a beautiful place. You get to you can go horseback riding. You can go on dolphin watches. So it's a really gorgeous place. The sands are soft as flower. Uh, it's a bit well kept secret. Not many people know about it except those who watched MTV a long time ago. Uh, but yeah, yeah I, I think it was it. a reality show based there. I know about it from spring break and I've traveled Texas a lot. I've driven across it, which takes something like three days. It's such a big state. Uh, and that was one of the more fun <laughs> places that I remember. Great food town. So is Houston. So is Austin uh, and Dallas. Yeah. Amazing food towns. You come from a very strong food state. How did you find yourself in New York City? Uh, well, New York City, it was, you know, again, I, I think I mentioned I was in Austin when uh, New York Times paper hit the table and it was it was an article on the East Coast seafood. And it, you know, it it went all the way from Maryland, you know, down to New York City and um, and just talked about the varieties of seafood, which we we don't really have uh, down in in South Texas or at least when I was there, not a lot of many people were were educated on it and really didn't know how to work with those types of seafood. So it, it was very intriguing. Uh, it was either Chicago or here and I uh, ultimately chose here, uh, which was amazing because I got to work with Chef Dave, uh, deemed by Tony, Anthony Bourdain as a chef whisperer. So that's chef what Dave I read. Pasternak, one of the chef yeah. everybody loves. One of, one of the great gods of seafood without question and all food. Absolutely. Yeah. He's amazing. Um, really took me under his wing and, you know, showed me just, he, like they say, they sh he showed me the ropes. Uh, he's a, he's very true to his craft. Very, very true to sustainable seafood. Very true to, you know, getting fresh, fresh fish, the freshest you can have, you know, sometimes skipping the market and going straight to the fishermen themselves. Uh, farms, you actually used to pull up into Esca uh with a truck full of things asking him if he'd like to buy them because they were so in season and you know uh that's one of the great things about him he keeps his menu true to uh true to the season so i, I learned that from him which was awesome yeah, he was really a champion of, of super local hyper local seafood he was always fishing when he wasn't working so i, I imagine he split his time 50 50 between fishing and, and working in the kitchen because he was always working as well uh, and he, he taught me and, and a lot of us about what local seafood is. Uh, there's, there are varieties that I, I think most people still haven't heard of that are absolutely delicious, abundant, and sustainable. And I'm so happy that you get to tap into that at Malibu Farm. You're literally on the seaport. Do you ever get tempted to throw a net out your backyard and see what you drag in? Well, I guess it's the we were just talk, We were just talking about that. <laughs> we were just talking about that. Yeah, you know, you know, those Sundays when you're like, am I going to, you know, am, am, you're getting close to not having something on the menu. You're like, oh, yes. I can just go fishing. You just go fishing real quick. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been be tough. So cool. <laughs> um, I'm so I'm yeah. psyched about what you're making today. I, I think it's a perfect demo recipe for two reasons. One, your recipe is very simple. And two, it's a dish everybody needs to know and wants to know how to make. <laughs> uh, I can't wait to see how you make your crab cake. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah this is, um, you know, we, we do this with in congruent with Malibu Farm. Um, Malibu Farm is, you know, this is called a 21 mile crab cake. And uh, the reason for that is because Malibu was once known as a 27 mile, uh, seven miles of beauty. And there was a sign that actually framed, you know, right when you drove into, right when you got to it and you drove in, there was a sign that said 27 miles beauty um, or something to that nature. And uh, someone came along at, and measured it and found out it was actually 21 miles, uh, not 27. So it's an inside joke uh, for Helene Henderson and everyone at Malibu because everyone had to change the signs uh, on their restaurant and, and businesses. So we get to make the Tiki Toe Crab Cake. Um, I'm ready to begin yeah, super, the demo. Yeah, super psyched to see, to see how you make it. Oh. Uh, I know you get your Tiki Toe from a, a beloved purveyor in Maine. 
would love to hear about her and anything else you want to talk about. All right, but uh, Ingrid Seafood and uh, Sue Buxton is actually who we get it from. This is, and it says it here, you know, you can't read it anymore. It's a day boat, fresh seafood, um, Stonington, Maine crab. So the crab is picked fresh, you know, when you order it, she, you know, she does ask for a heads up because when you order it, it's picked fresh, cooked right there, you know, and sent to you as fresh as can be. It's not sitting in a can, it's not sitting in a warehouse somewhere. Um, which is very so, hard to find. There's almost no fresh meat or fish that comes to you that direct without a lot of processing in between. So I'm super psyched that you, you've managed to find a purveyor. Do you have a do you have a beauty there that you can show us so we all know what we're heading for? What we're, what we're I actually on? do. I think I, I see it. Do. I see it in the corner. There we go. Wow. This is it right there. That. That's, and that's on the menu for $27 every day of the week. Is that right? That's right. That's right. All right, guys, everybody who's listening, you need to go in and try this dish. Please. It's amazing. Let me know when you come here too. Um, so yeah, we can, we can go ahead and start off. Yeah, let's do it. So right now, you know, again, we're taking the, the peak toe crab cake. They usually come in eight ounce, um, eight ounce containers. I know your recipe says uh, four pounds. So you'd be using two of these um, or you can have the recipe if you need. So here we have on ice, uh, we have the pizza toe. It's already been picked and clean. Um, you know, they have a lot of great pickers. So, so some, some of these pickers can actually hear the shell hit, hit the, hit the bowl. Uh, and so, you know, they take pride in what they do. So thanks to them. Um, we're going to go ahead and take this crab meat that's been picked again over ice. See it there. Super cool. Now you mentioned the ice twice, chef. Everyone watching, this is how important it is to keep it super cold. No, this is imp very important. This is what chefs do. When we work with seafood, especially raw seafood, uh, we keep it on ice everywhere we travel with it. So if we take it out of the fridge and bring it to a cutting board and a station, it's on ice. If we bring it back to the stove, it's on ice. That's how important it is to keep it cold. Those are really good practices, best practices. Absolutely. Um, and again, you want to pick the shells out, but you want to leave as as many pieces as you can whole. Um, you know, we have a nice piece of leg right there. Peaky toe crab that you can use other crab. Of course, you've heard of the blue crab, but peaky toe crab is very sweet, uh, very salty. It holds a salinity from the ocean. So that's why we choose it. It's a used to be a bycatch and, and a lot of a lot of people used to throw it away. But chefs prefer it now because it's so consistent. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and start off. We're going with the, I'm gonna go ahead and throw in the, the celery. And this is quick. Once you get your meat and flaws done, and if you need me to slow down Rocco or just let me know. No, that's cool. The, the, the pace is perfect. So big bowl, crab first, then the celery. Yep, yeah, you wanna get your celery. I got the celery, shallots. In there, yeah. And I like to I like to do this first, just to integrate it with the crab, just to get it nice and distributed. And look uh, at how you carefully you're folding this together. Another great yeah. lesson to learn. There you go. And then we'll start going with the. We'll go in with the mayo. Now, if you don't have mayonnaise at home, you know, we, we do an aioli as well in-house, which is eggs, lemon, egg yolks, lemon, and olive oil just blended together. So I did that together. That's one and egg folding yolk. it nice. Yep. That's one egg yolk, yep. A lot of recipes. Amazing how it holds the shape. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's actually really nice. A lot of recipes do call for a whole egg. Um, we don't necessarily add the egg white in here just because the fat from the egg yolk really helps hold everything together. You get a bit of lemon juice. So the Dijon mustard. And then it says sriracha to taste. Now, this is where everyone's taste comes in, right? You can make them nice and spicy, uh, which is different than a crab cake. You don't want to, you know, that's that's up to you. This has a nice citrusy flavor. So 
we add a little bit of that just to bring just a tiny bit, bit of heat to give the crab cake another layer of flavor. And sriracha is a gentle hot sauce, I would say, not as hot as some others. It's got a little bit of sweetness, which is lovely. So don't be afraid to uh, experiment a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And then, so your recipe should, it says, uh, I believe it says you should have about a half a cup or a cup and a half of breadcrumbs. So That's these, right. this actually they're cornflake crumbs. Uh, we do try to do, we do try to have a lot of gluten-free menu items available for our guests, just because there's, you know, there's a lot of diets out there. So everyone loves a crab cake. We didn't want to leave anyone out. I especially didn't because I love crab cakes as well. So we decided to use uh, gluten-free cornflake crumbs um, in order to hold this together. We're taking about two tablespoons of that and folded it in. And Chef, these are cornflake crumbs that you make yourself or that you're able to buy or how does that work? We're actually, we're actually able to buy them. Um, cornflake crumbs, it's really easy. If you have a spice grinder, you know, especially for this amount, if you have a spice grinder, you can stick those cornflake crumbs in there. To be honest, you don't have to have them as fine as this. Um, you can just take and crumble either mortar and pesto. It, pestle. Um, you can crush the cornflakes and leave them a little bit, a little bit whole because then when you take this, you fold them in and you actually let them cool for 30 minutes. Um, then, you know, that it'll give more body to the crab cake. So I'm folding that in. And this is what your this is what your you know final product should look oh, like. Cool. Let's get a good look at that. So what's mm -hmm. awesome is that there's still very large chunks of crab in there. And that's what I find is so hard to do. Keep it whole. That's what you want, right? Yeah. Okay. So then after this, we take, so you're going to form balls and, and you're going to form little patties of this right here. Uh, oh, Don. And for those of you at home that were paying attention, we're going to fold in the parsley. That was one of them that almost escaped. It almost got away. Uh, another <laughs> layer. That's okay. Another layer. Fresh herbs, so yeah. another layer. It's very nice. Okay, cool. Okay, got that in there. And you're gonna go ahead and form fresh, nice fresh patties. Your patty, when you start doing it, should look. There we go. Your patty should be in this shape. Wow, that's a big. That's a big patty. So, what's a, is it about four ounces? Would you say? Exactly about four ounces. Okay. Yes. Okay. So this recipe will yield four four ounce patties. Yeah, it'll yield Very four nice. four ounce, maybe a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and I can show you how to do this. And Chef, I have to ask because someone's going to ask me if you have a shellfish allergy but can eat fish, could you replace the, the crab with flake cod, yeah, had yeah. a pollock, something like that? Absolutely, yes, yes. Uh, uh, cod would be nice. You know, it, it gets to be nice and sweet. Haddock as well. Um, you can definitely do that. Make fish cakes. Very cool. Fish cakes are good. That'll actually be nice and fun. All right. So, taking that. Now, next, we're going to go into the Old Bay aioli. And for those of you who get stumped by the word aioli, please don't. It's just a garlic-based mayonnaise. That's all it is. That's it. And in this one, we're going to add uh, Old Bay and some other ingredients like capers and parsley and shallots. Right. So you, um, you take in some of the, you're going to get the mustard, mustard and the mayo going. You can take some of the lemon juice, get that lemon juice in there. And I'm just with the fork, just make sure that all of that's incorporated together. You 
taking the capers. Some of the shallots. And you're taking your herbs. And then Old Bay, you can use Old Bay, you can use some um, Cajun spices as well. Uh, you can make your own spices home at home. That looks like a South Padre mix right there. Yeah. That spice mix. <laughs> Without the beer. <laughs> All right, so yep. That's about the color you want right there. Okay. And then, as you should all the time, taste to see where that's at. Yum. Very Looks nice. so good. I'm going to actually add a little bit more lemon to that. All right, and that's ready to go. Okay. Now, all of this, again, you want to chill. You want to chill before serving any of that. Um, always chill. All right, and then next, next we have the lemon bin. How's everybody doing? Is everybody okay? Everybody's great. We're, we're terrific. Right, There's a bunch of questions. I'm waiting for a natural pause in the conversation, as they would say, for, for us to get to some okay. questions. The crab is already cooked. Yes, it is, Diane McCabe. Uh, yeah. It's almost impossible to get raw crab meat. They usually cook it to remove it from the shell. Please jump in anytime, Chef Trevino, to uh, tell the story of your particular purveyor, but uh, it's, al it's almost impossible to get the meat out of the shell unless it's cooked a little bit. Right, absolutely. They, they cook that, you know, right on site, right when that cra crab comes out of the pots or, you know, the fishermen separate it from the, the um, bycatch. Uh, there's, there's actually a story that ta they take it to you know, it's a really family family run business. So they take it to the wives, the wives get everyone, you know, everyone gets in on, on the mix and, and picks the crab. Um, you want to actually cook the crab right when you get it, just so it stays fresh. It locks in that salty uh, seawater and it preserves the flavor. Uh, it does spoil really quick. So if you don't cook it as quick, you, you can lose a lot of it. So definitely want to cook that, cook that out. Yeah, so anytime you're buying crab uh, in a store, even your you know the best markets, if it's picked crab in a pint container, it's almost always cooked. If it's alive, obviously it's not cooked yet. But if it's red, it's been cooked. Natural color of crab is you know either blue, gray, light light red. The peaky toe crab is sort of a sandy color, so um, that's how you know if it's cooked or not. You know, I found out that. Um... In Maine, it's called pick toe. So because the, the, the actual legs look like a little pick. And oh, cool. it's, I think uh, when somebody, someone sold it to one of the chefs here, they, they heard peaky toe. And they were like, well, maybe it's a Maine accent, but that's when they started selling us peaky toe. The first chef right, I so heard using it was Charlie Trotter in the 90s. And I, he's probably the one who added a little Midwestern twang to it and called it peaky toe. It definitely yep. looked good on a menu. Yep. We all were intrigued by the name. Right, and, and it wasn't until some, someone actually used that name that it, the market just flew, just open wide. Um, okay, so we're gonna do the lemon vinaigrette. This lemon vinaigrette, you can, you can substitute with lime. You can do orange. Um, you can do a mix of citrus, you know, just to the level of flavors. So you can definitely use citrus is of your choice. Just get that going in there. And then we're going to lightly whisk some olive oil in. Now you can do this in a blender as well. Uh, when you do it in a blender, it comes out a little bit creamier. Chef, this doesn't need to be super emulsified, right? It's okay if it's a slightly broken vinaigrette. Absolutely, yeah. You're gonna you're gonna use it on, you know, rocket rocket arugula or some greens. You're just gonna lightly dress it. I uh, will go on. The greens go underneath the crab cake. 
Um, you can also use it. I have these beautiful radishes here. If you have any radishes at home, um, even raw, you know, delicious turnips you can use. And then I'm just adding a little bit of salt. Right, you don't need, you don't, do not need it emulsified. Again, if you want some emulsification, it does last longer if you do, you know, you do this mix on a bigger batch. Yeah, but basically what we're looking for is the, the right balance of olive oil and lemon flavors, emulsified or not, it, sh it should work. Right, you want something bright. Um, you know, the crab cake obviously has a lot of flavor. Uh, you super really rich. want those yeah. super rich. You want those greens to shine. Um, and the lim lemon will also cut into the fattiness of the crab. Everything else. Cool, it's good. Okay. So now we're at a pause if you want to. <laughs> I was going to point out that uh, when you watch really good chefs work, the thing that they do that other chefs don't or, or a lot of home cooks forget to do is taste the food constantly. I, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but Chef Amy has tasted the food five, six, seven, eight times already and, re and adjusts and readjusts and uh, reacts to what's happening in the bowl. The recipe is a great start, but you have to confirm what you suspect, you know, based on the recipe. The recipe is just a, you know, a sketch. It's a thesis. You know, you, you have to, you have right. to prove, you have to prove that what you put on paper actually works by tasting it. Right. You know, a lot of, a lot of things that you make, even, uh, even, you know, aiolis, lemon aiolis, or any cream based um, or egg based sauces or anything like that can lose a lot of flavor you know as they sit or as they go the next day if you want to you know you have leftovers so you want to adjust you want to taste again even though it tasted good yesterday you know might have lost acidity um the next day so always always taste and the ingredients are always changing the the crab will taste different on one day versus another day so it's it's super important to confirm using your taste buds the most important cooking tool and we're all born with one with the palate that is yes sir all right so we can start cooking again the crab cakes we got these beauties i cheated i have five amazing they look great there's going to be at least five questions about what oil you're using so let's let's get into that let's do it okay uh so oil uh high smoke point obviously you don't want to start off with olive oil uh, because it does have a learn low smoke point. Um, canola oil is something that we use here. We use a non-GMO canola oil just because it's a it's a preference that we try to stick with. Uh, you can use vegetable oil. You can use safflower oil. Uh, anything anything with a high high smoke point. So that way you don't burn your food. And are you trying to avoid the flavorful oils like uh, olive oil in this case because we you just don't need that extra flavor? Right, you don't need the flavor. You you don't want to add that to the expense. crab cakes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, you want you want do you want to keep it light? Again, you want to get the pan hot enough to where you're going to get a nice sear um, on the outside. And olive oil tends to start smoking and burning too soon. And it's especially important if you're using corn flakes, which have a lot of sugar in them. They'll they'll burn very fast if the temperature isn't right. Can we just go over how you breaded those? So uh, the cornflakes go inside the mix and also in the breading? Right, the cornflakes go inside the mix, also in the breading. Uh, let's see. So was it a standard breading procedure, flour, eggs, cornflake, breadcrumb? So no, actually, you know, you want to keep it light again. You want to, okay. you want to go, go into the bowl. So see if I can grab one of these over here. I'll bring it, I'll bring a ball over. So again, you're taking, you're taking your, your crab, right. And you're forming, you're forming a ball. Mm -hmm. Or maybe a disc, if you will, you do this and all you really do is gently fold it into the, 
into the cornflakes. Well, that's a lot less work. That's super cool. So there's enough moisture in the uh, mix itself to get the cornflakes to adhere, which is a great, right. well, great news if you're making a lot because you can spend hours just breading these. Right. There's always, you know, the the what is it? Milk, milk flour, milk flour, egg yolk. This is this. This is what I love about these. Actually, I fell in love with these because it's just coating with the with the uh, cornflakes. So that's really cool. You know, panko breadcrumbs you can use as well. They have now this uh, gluten free, a gluten free rice flour, uh, or actually gluten free uh, rice, rice crumbs. crumbs. Yeah. Yeah. So it's those are really cool. Rice. Have, yeah, there's all kinds of options. Yeah, I think uh, quinoa flour was something else that I've used. I've only used that as a thickener, but. We're getting lots of love for the gluten-free options, by the way. Oh, awesome. Cool, cool, yeah. cool. Um, yeah, so we there's a gluten-free uh, bread as well that you can, if you use that and you want to go that route, you want to, you know, cut, cut the gluten-free bread into cubes. Uh, you want to toast it a little bit and leave it out leave it out kind of like day bread, day old bread, but uh, you want to toast the gluten-free breadcrumbs first uh, or bread. So that way, when you do crumble it in, it does give the, the gluten-free bread a little bit more body and it actually adds to the crab cake. All right, just waiting for the pan to get hot here. So Donna, like Cox, Donna Cox is one of our viewers who really appreciates the fact that it's gluten-free. Um, I think she's a return viewer, if I remember correctly. And, Eva Heinemann, also who's back uh, for for at least the tenth time. Thank you, Eva. Uh, I appreciate I appreciate you coming back. And a non-reactive bowl is something that's usually made with stainless steel or glass, uh, and that doesn't react to any of the ingredients in the recipe. So if it were an aluminum bowl, it might react to lemon juice, for example. So a non-reactive bowl is probably what you already own. So no reason to worry or look for anything new. It's just stainless steel or glass or Pyrex or even plastic bowls are non-reactive. Yeah, thank you guys for coming back. Appreciate it. The uh, non-reactive language is sort of uh, an antiquated term that comes from old recipe writing. I, I still put it in all my recipes because publishers really like that term for some reason. I yeah. guess there's, there's still people out there using raw aluminum uh, or tin in their cooking. Uh, that we have to watch out for. Right. Well, that's where the whole green eggs and ham comes from, right? You you put you put eggs into a, a pan like that's gonna have a green color. At least that's where I. <laughs> that's, that's very that's cool. How, yeah. That's where I uh, got that. That's from. where Dr. Seuss I, got it from. I, that, I think so. I think he was, and he just you know added ham and ate them anyway. I don't know when it happened first. When I when I you know was starting to cook and it happened with me, I was I didn't eat them. I would but definitely I'm, I'm stay pretty... away from green eggs for sure. Yeah. Now you're using an induction cooker, which is every every chef's favorite cooktop cook surface. It travels well, um, but it needs a certain kind of pan, a pan that has a, a layer of uh, steel or iron, something magnetic or has magnetic properties in order for it to work. It's sort of like a, an inverse microwave. And that's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for the, the steel and the induction to connect and heat up to love each other yes i can see that <laughs> the oil is wavy that's good that's a good yeah, it's sight. wavy now uh so that's wavy another test is you know you can throw a little bit of the breadcrumbs in there once they start to sizzle that's good we're going to lower that now and get our crab cake in you can hear it nice sizzle Ooh. Snap, crackle, pop. Yes. So if you're working at home, you want to take your you want to take your flame down to a medium, uh, medium low. And I like to really let the crab cake work on one side, so that way you get a nice sear. Uh, it doesn't break. Yeah, and because then, when you, so when I'm you're sorry, as careful ahead. as you were with the other ingredients, which is to say. You use very little non-crab ingredients, which makes a great crab cake great. You have to be super careful, right? Because there's really nothing holding it together on purpose. That's in, that's intended to be like that, isn't that right, Chef? Absolutely. Um, you know, you have you have a lot of places that, you know, they get they get uh, 
you get bread in there, you and it's a lot of bread. You get a lot more of the other celery ingredients. And such. Yeah. And yeah, guys, you want to you want to lift the crab cake up a little bit just to check to see where it's at. The one with the crab. So basically, um, we're so waiting for the for the crab to warm up and for the crust to brown. Is that that is that right? That's all sort of all we need to do at this point because everything is cooked inside. That's right. That's all you need to do. Uh, if you want to you want to get it to. Then you get a nice little sear. Everything's cooked inside. Flipping it. Beautiful. There's that guy right there. Wow, look at that. Can we see more of that? That's gorgeous. Look Ooh. at that brown, beautiful crust. Wow. That's cornflakes, guys. That is gorgeous. <laughs> and you use very little oil. You didn't have to use a lot of oil to get those, um, get that beautiful result. Right, you don't have to deep fry these. Um, you know, there's an option to bake if you want to bake yeah. these. Yeah. Uh, you can, you can spray. You know, either put parchment paper down on a sheet tray, um, wax paper, spray it down with uh, a little bit of the, you know, any pan spray. And once you put the crab cakes on, you want to preheat your oven to about four, four fifty, because you want to get them hot quick. Um, so those, you know, those tend to break a little, a little less if you don't want to do the flipping action. So that, that's another way to cook your crab. Uh, here, you can take it from here, cook it through, or you can put this into a 300 or 400 degree oven or 350 to 400 degree oven. So that way it'll warm all the way through. Uh, that's another option as well. So there's literally five or six different ways to cook this. Saute it in a pan, cook it in an oven. You could probably throw it under a broiler. I, I dare say you could probably microwave it, but I won't I won't say that out loud. Uh, and uh, Laura is saying that she wishes she could taste this right now. But chef, she can taste this right now if she came down to Malibu Farm, couldn't she? Yeah, Laura, was it? Yeah, Laura. She she wants to come where, visit. Where are you, Laura? Come visit. <laughs> Just go down 89 South Street and, and chef will be there waiting for you. Listen, there's 89 South Street. There's Malibu in, in Malibu. You know, there's a lot of locations and you can take your pick. We'd, pr we'd rather have you here, but yeah, we're, we're here for you. All right, I'm going to turn this guy off and then we can plate. So lots of questions about alternative ways to cook this. Uh, Jokama Miller is asking about broiling. I think you covered that. Uh, Wendy's making jokes about uh, our snap crackle pop method. It works, Wendy. I promise you. <laughs> and uh, Donna wants to know if you can pre cook and reheat the oven. And I think you covered that, Chef. Uh, I think this is definitely something you could brown in advance. What do you think? Right, you can brown the you can brown these in advance. Um, if you're doing something, you know, you're doing a big party, you can brown them in advance. Um, get them cooled quick, and then when you're ready to serve them, you can pop them into a into an oven. There's some talk out there about. Uh, being able to freeze crab cakes, I do not recommend that uh, just because you want them fresh. So it's a it's a day to day. If you're going to cook them the next, you know, put them in the oven the next day or in a couple hours, then absolutely you can pre pre sear them. Uh, you you want to be careful, though, because the the moisture of every ingredient you just added can seep through. Uh, so you want to check that the humidity of your refrigeration also makes a huge difference. So if you do that, just make sure you have some other breadcrumbs on on hand. So just in case you need to roll them in again. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. There are a lot of places that have to make a large quantity and they'll freeze them in advance. And I think what Chef said about having extra breadcrumbs in, in, in hand to perhaps you know, rebread them is a really good way to hedge your bets. So if you need to freeze it, do it. Chef doesn't recommend it, obviously, but if you need to do it and then just be ready to rebread or just uh, dust it up a little bit if you have to. There's uh, obviously also um, any any ingredients that freeze uh, inside the crab cake when they defrost may fall apart and the cake could just completely fall apart and turn into crab crumbs, which you don't want. So, but right, if, you have if the you celery, deep fry it, it'll water. be good. That's my usually my rule about everything yeah. frozen. Deep fry it, it'll be fine. Yeah, throw that in a deep fryer. That's that's. That's a, that'll be amazing. Um, so we're gonna, you know, we didn't take that arugula, the lemon aioli that you made, or I'm sorry, lemon vinaigrette that you made. We're gonna take a little bit of rocket arugula. You can use any green. 
right? You can use chicory, seasonal greens. Uh, chicory has a little bit more bite to it. So, you know, it'll complement the crab as well. I'm using some rocket arugula. Uh, and I have to throw in, Rocco, that we did use um, farm fresh eggs in the crab cake. Uh, we, we work with this really amazing farm called Fat Apple Farm that we get our eggs from. Uh, they have free roaming uh, chickens. I was going to say free roaming eggs. Uh, they have free roaming chickens. So, you know, that's, that's another. If you saw the egg, which you, the egg yolk is really bright, really orange, really fatty. And uh, it's something that you can, you can look at. You can see the difference between regular eggs and, and farm eggs. Um, I noticed the yolk when you added it. It was very plump, very orange, looked delicious. What's the name of the farm again? It's called Fat Apple Farm. Fat Apple. Okay, cool. Maybe Fat we'll Apple put a Farm. link in and we'll see if we can buy uh, eggs from Fat Apple ourselves. Yeah, they're great. They're amazing. And they, they do great wholesale uh, great wholesale sell prices as well. All right, so we have your lemon vin. Again, you can see we use a little blender, so it's more of emulsified. Add a little bit of salt. Cracked pepper. We're just and you want to be gentle with this, right? You don't want to you don't want to crush them. A lot of people I see crushing um, greens. It it really breaks breaks and bruises the greens. So throw that here. And then we have our old bay aioli. I went ahead and put this in a squeeze bottle. Um, again, if you if you're doing a big event, you can put it in a squeeze bottle. If you put it in the squeeze bottle, the old bay aioli, you want to get that into a blender with a little bit more oil uh, or a little bit more lemon juice. So that way you can break down the capers and break down those pieces or the squeeze bottle. We use the chef cut technique where you cut the tip. So that way you're able to get all those out. Well, look at these little drops. Uh, you know, this is the fun part. People can cut, cut the crab cake and just kind of go into the, go into these guys. So we pop the crab cake up there. It's so funny with a crab cake, you never know if you, if you want an appetizer or not, because it's sort of an appetizer kind of food, but you always want enough to fill you up. That's a really nice size uh, crab cake. So I think there's no reason, you know, if you, if you end up at Malibu Farms and you order the crab cake, you know, you're going to get full, as they would say, and topping it off with a nice big avocado looks delicious. Yeah, but you can also have two. We won't, we won't hold you back. <laughs> Double order, everybody. Yeah. Uh, what we do for brunch, um, and again, if you have any leftover crab cakes or you want to save some, we actually poach it, you know, we'll poach an egg and we'll make a, a Cajun hollandaise as well. Um, and that, that sells a lot during brunch. So avocado technique, this is one of my favorites. Uh, we have the avocados from the avocado guy. Um, a lot of chefs use them here in New York. Perfect avocados all the time. Um, when you cut your avocado in half and take the seed out, one of the methods I like to use is a big spoon method, right? So you're kind of curving in and you're scooping the avocado and get rid of that. Scooping the avocado and then you're turning it, turning Beautiful. it around. Wow, that works really well. So then, and Chef, when you said the avocado guy, you're talking about a company called the Avocado Guy. For everyone, for everyone out there who was right. listening and maybe thought Amy has a guy, she's talking about an actual person. I have a guy. Yeah, yeah, it's called the Avocado Guy. I don't know if they sell retail, do they? Um, I'm not sure if they do. But you can find them on, on Instagram, uh, the avocado guy on Instagram. He's Maybe, on Instagram. Uh, hit them up. Uh, slide into their DM, see if you can get some ripe avocados. Right. He, he may, he may uh, make, make an exception. He, he delivers a lot. So the avocado, what we do is I, I fan it out. Again, you can, you, can do, you can do cubes if you want. I just fan it out, and I'll go just kind of like if you were cutting into an onion ready to dice it. I'll just go into the middle, just make these nice little cuts. And then you're going against the, 
I use this guy and I just fan him out. Pop him on top. Beautiful. Wow. Looking so delicious. And, and again, if you, uh, another garnish, I know yours says avocado, another garnish we do, we'll do a little bit of the lemon. Squeeze a little bit of the lemon on there. And then another garnish I like to use are these uh, radishes. So these are really, these are called watermelon radish. You wanna, thank you. These guys you wanna find, Julianne. And chef, are you a believer that you should soak the watermelon radish slices in ice water? before or do you do you leave them as they I, are? I actually do so I, I make I actually make my my guys soak the actual radish in ice water before they slice them uh, just to get good cuts and then we do soak the, the watermelon radish in a little bit of ice water uh, just so they crisp up right a lot of you know if, if air hits these um, they can wilt they'll lose a lot of the they'll lose a lot of the moisture if you if you put them in ice water, they'll actually they'll actually uh, firm up and become crunchier. And that's the that's the actual um, that's the texture you want to add to you know any plate like this or any dish when you use radish. You want to add the texture. You want that crispness. And I'm I believe that the ice does that for. Yeah, and then so you can top it's it. It's like a super hydrating water. lotion almost. The the water just gets absorbed and it gets super crispy. The opposite of wilted. The opposite, exactly. And then I take a little bit mal maldon sea salt, pepper. Super yeah, important it. to season avocado, everybody. You notice that uh, Lois actually asked Chef if you wipe the avocado with a lemon juice soaked paper towel. Was that did the, did you actually do that? I did. You saw that, huh? Yeah. Yes. So Lois Burke did. noticed that. And Good job. that's obviously for two reasons, right? Flavor and oxidation. Right. So also the, the avocado, when it's against the, you know, when it's against the skin, it still has, it still has a little bit of that, um, that contact from the skin, which, you know, when you're, when you're pre-prepping avocados, you wipe that contact from there and it'll actually hold the oxidation process um, from happening sooner. So we do that here with a little bit of lemon water. We'll we'll also um, put some of that on top. Right now, I didn't have it with me, so yes, that was a that was a lemon water paper towel. Good Super job. cool pro tip right there. Thank you for noticing, Lois. You must have very highly trained eyes. Uh, and then Donna is Donna says it's beautiful. How many avocados will it take to get it to look that beautiful? Uh, you know, listen, Chef Amy's been doing this for a long time. I'm not going to say it's going to take as long as she's put in but uh, it doesn't take more than a few avocados you might want to start by getting great avocados from the avocado guy uh ron put the link yeah. in the in the chat box so now you all have access to him he used to be an industry secret so consider yourself uh super privileged to have access to this guy the best avocados in new york city that i know of and uh joke yeah. millar says gorgeous and i think she's talking about the beautiful plate of crab cake you have in front of you can we get a close-up yes Wow, that's incredible. Look at that. It's huge. And you can see how all the flavors are going to work together. The, the aioli, the, uh, the juicy unctuousness of the aioli, the rocket is going to be, you know, a little bit bitter, but not too much. The luscious uh, uh, avocado. And then, of course, the delicious crab that goes well with so many flavors. Are you going to break into it? Give us a give us a view of what it looks like inside. Yes, yeah, so I actually did not eat because I'm so uh, I will. <laughs> to do it with a spoon. Well, we can get you the employee discount. Don't worry. <laughs> I, have to, I have to. It's a manager's comp. <laughs> Georgina, you want to bite? Georgina has right. has been double dutying as head of marketing and camera person for both uh, both John George restaurants at the South Street Seaport. Definitely deserves a bite. She does. She's been working hard. Diane McCabe says, I'm making these as well as coming to your brunch. You had me at egg on top of the crab cake. Uh, do you serve? I hope you serve <laughs> it at brunch, or if not, now you have to. Mm. 
Oh, the first uh, bite of something you just made is so fun. Like a that chipmunk. Is, that quiet sound is the sound of deliciousness. Can we see what mm -hmm. it looks like inside? Yep. Maybe just turn it a little bit. Yeah. Yum. Beautiful. Big There's a lot of crab. pieces of crab. And uh, a question about Maldon Sea Salt. It's uh, it is a brand and a place, and it's M A L D O N. It's a large flaky uh, sea salt variety. It's basically evaporated seawater, and it looks it looks like um, costume jewelry. Actually, it's it, there's such large square flakes with so many diamonds. facets. It looks like it could be costume jewelry, like diamonds. And you can use you know there's there's gray sea salt as well, Florida salt. I, I prefer this because you can you can control the bites. Every every bite that you have is like a, a hit of salt. So, but you're not getting everything too salty. But yeah, yes, the, and good. the avocado is really important as well. So good. Uh, and chef, people want to know if you're open to Thanksgiving. What are you serving? We are open for Thanksgiving. Uh, we have Thanksgiving specials. We're actually doing for the, you know, for vegetarians. Uh, we're doing a harvest uh, squash, we'll stuff acorn. Uh, we did a farro risotto, a mushroom risotto. Uh, that goes inside the baked acorn with a uh, spinach bechamel. Uh, so that's that offering. We're doing, of course, the traditional Thanksgiving plate and um, so a few sides that are that are seasonal as well. That sounds incredible. So we are. Are, you doing a, are you doing a prefix or a regular a la carte menu? No, you know, I know that um, there's a lot, a lot more, you know, Friendsgiving stuff going on not a lot of people have family here not a lot of people can fly out because of the because of the climate um right now so to speak yeah, so yeah we decided we decided not to put that on on people wanting to come in and just have a good time together so we decided to offer specials instead oh that's great so it's just the, lots of options all everything is a la carte you don't have to commit to a big number to dine there on thanksgiving that's great news and i imagine you're open most of most of the day starting at noon or noonish Right, starting noon, uh, noon to eight, noon to eight p.m. is the last eating. Ron, but yeah, Ron whoever just said the brunch. Reggie link in the chat box. So if you want to make a reservation, yes. you could click the link in the chat box. Uh, you also sell pies to go. Tell me all we about actually the pies do. to go yes. program. Yeah. So, um, so the pies to go program. Uh, there's <laughs> there's a whole thing called we only have pies for you, which is hilarious. Um, <laughs> that. Uh, our chef Paula uh, of the Seaport is a, is a really amazing pastry chef. Uh, she's she actually put the pies together. One of them's pecan pie, or pecan potato potato. Uh, the other one is how do you say it, Rocco? I say pecan when I'm feeling fancy, but pecan most of the time. How do they say it in Texas? Uh, it just depends what part of Texas you're. Oh, okay. Down, down, down south, south. We say pecan pecans and uh a little bit up where you you know you go into the hill country and say pecans got it good news is they're like always place. delicious pecans oh, are, they are absolutely so stunning not stunning flavor uh so we're that that's the pie and then there's a there's a pumpkin pie and an apple crumb pie uh, there are also thanksgiving packages as well if you don't you know if it's too cold outside that day or you want to you want to get some friends together at the house we're also doing thanksgiving packages uh, as oh well. wow! To go that you can order in, in advance. Yes, that's, uh, you that's order. great news. Absolutely. So that's fun. Um, I, hear, so... I hear more and more people relying on restaurants for their Thanksgiving meals. I think it's a great idea. Restaurants need the business, and people need the help. It's a lot of work to put a Thanksgiving meal together. Right. It is. It, it is a lot of work. It's fun though. We have a lot of fun. We're doing a charity as well on Thanksgiving, which is which is awesome. Yeah, let's talk about the charity that you picked for the for today's uh, live broadcast. Uh, it's called World Central Kitchen, founded by Jose Andres, and uh, they address, among many other things, food insecurity issues. Why are you so passionate about them? Other than the obvious reason, we're chefs; we feed people for a living. Um, to be honest, uh, when I saw a, um, you know, when I saw the program Doctors Without Borders. 
I, it was always, it was always in my mind, like, why, why don't we have Chefs Without Borders? And as soon as I heard that chef, uh, Jose Andres was doing this, it, it, it blew my mind because that's exactly, exactly the vision that I had. Um, and he did it out, out of such a necessity and, and recognizing that necessity uh, when it happened, you know, when Puerto Rico happened and, you know, the disaster there happened, I really, really wanted to jump on a plane and go help. Uh, so, you know, a lot of these programs, they, they really empower communities through food nourishment. They go, they go into these disaster areas and they, I, they go into these disaster areas and they look to see what the problem is. They create, they create a setup at, in order to feed everyone, in order to get everyone the nourishment that they need. And not only that, they do set up uh, systems with the community. So it's not just an in and, in and out. Uh, they set up systems with the community. They make sure that they're, you know, they, they have empowerment uh, in order to, to be able to feed and in order to know if this happens again, you know, we, we have, we can take care of each other and they show them how. So that's, uh, to me, it's the most beautiful part of it. You know, they were just in Del Rio and they, you know, when, when they had those, when they had everyone there, uh, they fed a lot of those people that were coming across. So, you know, it's, it's a truly beautiful thing. One of the best things I love about the program is, you know, I just, signed up for it. Uh, they have a program for chefs now, uh, classes that you can take in order to learn how to set up something for your community in case of a disaster. So uh, super, super, uh, I'm just super happy that somebody decided to do this. Yeah, that's, you know, that's mainly it. Yeah, not just anybody, but one of the chefs who I think cares the most. We all care a lot about food security issues and Jose Andres is proven himself to be, you know, among the first people at a disaster site, no matter where it is in the world. Uh, you yeah. know, you've probably seen him on, on CNN and heard about him through friends. They do an incredible job. They've been at it for at least, uh, I think, oh, going on 15 years now. And you're right, the, their whole notion is, you know, feed people fish, teach people how to fish as well. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Great, great uh, organization to support. So if those of you who are watching feel inclined, uh, you know, donations will go to World Central Kitchen and at World Central Kitchen, all proceeds go to do the work. So there, there, there's a lot, not a lot of uh, admin, so to speak. All of it goes to do the work. Chef, there's still questions about salt. And I think we have time for one more question about salt. I love sea salt versus mine salt. Uh, you know, salt that you find in a mine came from the sea at one point, but it does change in flavor. What's your go-to uh, when you're just cooking every day and, and you, you know, you need to use a lot of salt and it can't be as fancy as a Maldon. What's your go-to? Oh, we, we, we use a kosher salt. That's, that's what we, we go Got to. It. If I don't have anything, if I don't have anything, that's in, that's in recipes. If I don't have anything such as that, I use a sea salt. You can use pink Himalayan salt. Uh, you can find those in, in cracked. Uh, there's also saltopia. I believe saltopia is a really great, uh, great link. Uh, if you look it up to find, you know, there's a bunch of salts out there. There's uh, salts that have been flavored that are really fun. Um, sea salts, again, that have been flavored with, you know, either lemon, kefir, lime, uh, which are also really great to play with. Uh, I, you know, if you cook at home and you really want to add layers of flavor, I would definitely look into having fun with those. Or you can make your own. Yeah, a lot of people are blending rosemary with salt now, making rosemary salt. I think it's thanks to a uh, TikTok chef who makes his own rosemary salt and talks about it all the time. So there's lots to, lots to do when it comes to salt. If you're using um, fine kosher salt, that's what 90% of chefs use every day for general cooking. And then when it comes to finishing, they'll tap something like a Maldon or a Cell Gris or uh, pink Himalayan salt, because you don't want to use that every day for all, all purposes of cooking. Chef Diane McCabe wants to know if you can get the crab in the public domain. Is it available to the regular everyday consumer? Right. So, uh, you know, one of, one of the things that did come out of, of um, COVID situation that we were in was a lot of, a lot of seafood purveyors did start doing a home, uh, home delivery, and, and you're able now to order just from your home. So they, if you find a seafood, 
purveyor, they, they definitely can, you definitely can get this. I would call ahead of time uh, just so they can get it in for you if they don't carry it. But uh, a lot of them have access to it, which is, which is really great. So true. And we put a lot of the links inside the chat box in both this uh, broadcast and previous broadcasts. Many, many purveyors that were uniquely chef go-tos are now available to the public. Uh, this has been so much fun. I think we got to almost all the questions. We'll be obviously answering the questions uh, later on and getting them to you in the follow-up email. So don't worry if your question wasn't uh, answered today. Uh, Chef Amy, thank you so much. You're at Malibu you. Farm, 89 South Street, uh, right next to the Fulton, which is a restaurant we were at not too long ago. Yes. Uh, it's a beautiful location. The restaurant is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, if you're in the area, please stop by. And you know what? Do do us a favor and do yourself a favor. Say that, you know, ask for Chef Amy and say that you saw her on the downtown uh, dine around at home. And, and, you know, you never know what will happen. Uh, please donate to uh, help support World Central Kitchen. This is the food security charity chosen by Malibu Farm. Uh, visit WCK.org to donate to them directly. And don't forget, we have one more coming up uh in december uh, well don't forget to post your plate to for a chance to win a 30-minute virtual cooking class with chef amy trevino of malibu malibu farm uh try the featured recipe please tag chef amy tag downtown alliance tag me and uh chef will pick chef will pick their favorite and uh a winner will be chosen and you'll get a 30-minute virtual cooking class with chef amy herself and don't forget to join us when we we host the bar room on downtown uh, Alliance's Diner Run at home, uh, December 16th, same time, same place. Uh, Executive pastry chef Abby Swain will be joining us. Uh, in the meanwhile, have a great Thanksgiving. I know that's coming up next week. Um, the most important ingredient to have at Thanksgiving is a good bottle of wine. It'll, it'll serve you well, trust me. Uh, thanks again. See you next time, December 16th. Have a good night, guys.